The USA scholarship system has long been a huge draw for promising women's footballers in this country. But West Ham defender Maz Pacheco did things her own way. 11 days after signing for the club in the summer, the left back graduated from Sheffield University with a law degree. That was the culmination of three years of incredibly hard work. A law degree is no easy feat anyway. As Maz says, you can't exactly wing it. But it was made much harder by the fact she was playing professionally for Reading in the WSL during those last two years. There's no glossing over it, that's a tough thing to do when you have to juggle your training with hours of lectures, seminars and assignments. But at the heart of that dedication, other than obviously wanting it for herself and her family, was to prove to other players that you didn't have to go to the States to get an education and play football. Maz herself turned down a scholarship at Harvard in order to pursue her career at home. Ultimately, that decision also shows the pull power the WSL has in this country now. Not only is the league attracting players from abroad, but it's also keeping players here. This is the Women's Football Diary with Maz Pacheco. Maz, welcome to the podcast uh, and thanks so much for taking the time out to speak with us on the show. As we record, it's what, two days since West Ham's first game of the WSL season, a 1-1 draw against Spurs. But I mean, first and foremost, how did it feel to get back out on the pitch? It might not necessarily have been three points, but just to get the season up and running. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, we've had a long long time off and it was good to get a competitive game in like I said before and it, it's really good to start start with the new girls and start with with a new team and new beginning for me so it was, it was a good baseline and then something to build off before we face Arsenal on Saturday. Definitely and you mentioned obviously you joined the club in the summer how's it been settling at the moment considering the world isn't quite as it was beforehand? Yeah. No, it's good. I think we've got a good bunch of girls, so it's a really good environment to be in. Um, we've been very welcoming, and I think we've got a few new players, so that obviously helps in terms of being a new player myself. It, we're kind of on that same same journey, so it was nice to nice to come into a team like that. Definitely, and there's I mean, there's been what eight odd signings um, mm. at the club in the summer. So that was going to be one of my questions: was when you bring in that many new players essentially how do you end up bringing that group together when like yourself so many of you are new to the club and experiencing things all for the first time together um I think it's just the question of being a good person so like Beardy's brought in the right characters um very chilled very easy to get along with and that helps and obviously team building will go down a treat and just being being around them all the time being in training being in, in that environment with them all helps and helps us grow as a team have you been able to do much of the, the team building social side of things at the moment or is it a little bit improvising at the moment it's, start, it's starting to relax especially since the government has started to relax things it's made things easier for us but it's still being aware and being clever and switched on about everything like it's, it's not going away yet and it's still still around covid and we haven't had a vaccine so it's making sure we do do things sensible and look we just want to play football so that that's our top priority definitely and i think everyone every football fan ultimately wants to see it as well mm -hmm. and matt beard yeah Western manager and he's kind of like one of my first big talking points, really, because he was obviously your mm -hmm. manager at Liverpool when you first came through. Yeah. How do you describe his influence on you as a person and as a player? Oh, I've, well, for, for me personally, it's obviously it's been massive because I grew up, basically grew up with him at Liverpool. Um, when he took over after he came from Chelsea, I was obviously still in the academy, and he very much was involved with them, came, watched us train, watched us play and I quickly found myself going through the ranks quicker than quicker than normal and ended up being in first team quicker than normal. So 
yeah, he's had, he's had a massive influence and just the way he plays in terms of, for me personally, how he wants his full-backs is, is what I like to be high and wide and, and like to be attacking. So, yeah, massive. Again, anyone who will have seen any of squad goals will know pretty much how passionate he is. <laughs> yeah. That, that pretty much him through and through. Yeah, look, he wears, he wears his heart on his sleeve, so he's got your best intentions at heart always. Um, yeah, and it's just his passion. He wants to win games, but who doesn't? You know, that that's our job. So when it's not going well, he, he's not afraid to tell us, and when it's going well, he, he'll tell us. So it's the best of both, really. Is it is it that sort of approach that is kind of why you've got quite a good connection between the two of you as a player and as a coach? Yeah, 100%. I think... On my first game, he was screaming at me left, right, and centre. But after the game, it's we can always chat, hug. Like we know it's on a professional level, so that that's all I need and all I want um, in a manager. If you could pick out, say, one of the biggest things he's taught you, what would it be? Um, to to not overthink and go with my instincts, because I'm very much. I like to do things perfect and sometimes that's, that's not always the case. Sometimes it, you have to just go with it. So, yeah, I'd say that. One of those things where, I say, when you, you overthink and things go round and round in your head a little bit and it's it maybe a bit of being in the here and now a bit more, is yeah. it that sort of thing? Yeah, I think it's because I, I struggled a bit towards the latter end of my career at Reading. Um, started to get less confident so I started to doubt myself more and he's trying to obviously change that to back to where he knows I am so it's getting all that doubt away getting getting my confidence back and trusting my instincts that's so, yeah. I mean, when you consider say all the people we've talked to on this show be it footballers whatever um, mm-hmm. sports you want to talk about and confidence plays such a big part I think in in all sorts of things, really, performance, yeah. um, anything to do with competition. How much of a challenge is it getting that confidence back if you've previously lost it? Um, it not that you lost it, but I think you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's part of the mental side of football. Um, it's something that you have to do internally. It can't be... You can depend on someone externally, but in the end, all that matters is how you how you change your own mindset and how you deal with it yourself. So it's very much, yes, he's, he's obviously a big influence and being in a new environment helps and new teammates help. But I, it's up to me at the end of the day how I, how I internalise it on the pitch and how I can change it into a positive mindset rather than negative. Almost clean slate, being at a new club, kind of helped that situation as well. Yeah, 100%. New environment, new club, new teammates, everything's different. So it's a lot harder, I would say, if I was in the same environment and going into the same club. That's when it gets really difficult and you have to do things differently. But when it's a a new challenge and it's fresh and everything's exciting and it's a new journey, it's a lot easier to, to take the positives out of it. With Matt Beard in mind, I suppose, who would you say has been your biggest influence in football? I'd say my mum, my family. I think for me, it's my mum and I've got two older brothers. So that, that's my close-knit group. It always has been. Um, they've been this for, since day one. Like My brothers always had to sacrifice them going out or going to work to have to take me to, to training. And same with my mum. All three of them would rotate and take turns taking me in stuff like that so the amount that they've sacrificed for me is obviously a massive influence because I wouldn't be where I am without them. That's again something that I think is so has come across as such a key thing for people that we've spoken to is how much yeah. that ultimately plays a part in yeah. where you're at now. Yeah. Talking about the West Ham squad, uh, the squad that you just come into again, who's the most underrated player in that team? Oh, underrated. <laughs> That's the question that always gets people thinking. <laughs> um, it's quite hard, quite hard to think. I would, 
I was quite um, surprised at Courtney, like our goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. But obviously, never like I don't really click on to players who I play against or anything like that. But I think from day one, seeing how good she is in goal and how how good she is at um, shot stopping, very much surprised me. So yeah, I was I was very impressed. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I say I think quite a few people remember her when she obviously stepped into the number one position. Yeah, as well. And, and looking at the previous highlights and what she saved, it's like, yeah, she's an unreal goalie. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of talent there. Mm-hmm. In terms of talent as well, because I kind of got to ask about Rachel Daly coming into the team mm. last week, which happened on my birthday. So that was one of her birthday surprise from the club for me. <laughs> but, nice. I mean, having her now part of the group. Does that, having someone like that, does it just elevate and lift everyone, I suppose, both on the morale level, but maybe in the performance level as well? Yeah, of course. Um, we're always looking to strengthen. And obviously, with things going on in America, we knew players are always going to come across. So it's that we managed to get one a homegrown player, which helps. So she knows the league, she knows how we play and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's still, still early doors for her. Um, she's getting to know the team, getting to know how we play. So I'll be, I'll be, it'll be interesting to see how she gets on, and I'm, I'm excited to have her in the team. And I think a lot of people are excited to see what she does in the mm-hmm. league too, considering yeah. what she's just come off the back of doing during the summer as well, being voted yeah. in and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Final question, specifically on West Ham, and bearing in mind the new training facilities that we talked about before we started recording, and also the new stadium too in Dagenham, and getting to play there. Yeah. What ultimately is the aim for West Ham? Not just in terms of, I suppose, league position, but maybe grabbing people's attention at the same time. Yeah, well, the new stadium obviously was a massive step forward. At Rush Green, their old stadium, um, there weren't a lot of seating areas and it was really open. So the fact that it's in Dagenham means we can get more families involved. Like They can bring the kids, the kids can sit down and older generations can come as well. And it's quite in the centre of, you know, the West Ham fans. So easy to get to. It's a proper proper match day feel to it, I would say. Um, so in terms of that, they're definitely looking to expand on a fan base and on an interaction level. Like the seats are very close to the pitch. It'll be easy for us to access the fans and fans to access us. So I think it's very exciting and it'll be, yeah, it'll be very exciting for the new home. And I can't wait for Saturday for when we play Arsenal. This is the Women's Football Diary by Sportspiel, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Audioboom, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Moving on then, and, and kind of looking at you and what you've been doing recently, and it's almost like you're some sort of professional multitasker. Um, <laughs> Various bits you've had, I'm specifically referring to the uh, law degree. You graduated what eleven days off yeah. West Ham from yeah. uni. How have, or rather, how tough or challenging has it been to juggle all of that? Um, yeah, three years considering you playing football. My, it was my first year. I would say it was easy because I was on campus. And then obviously my two year contract at Reading made it very hard in terms of it was three and a half hour drive away and having to do nine to five on my only two days off a week was hard. And it was just, it, it was hard. It felt like I couldn't really socialize with the girls. Um, I couldn't really switch off because obviously we would train and on double days we'd have gym and then I'd have to go back, sit on my desk and, do the day that I've just missed if that makes sense so all the lectures all the seminars that were on for that day I'd have to sit and watch and do the work and obviously submit the work that was due in as well um and with law you can't skip out really you can't wing it um so it was hard but it was something that I wanted and it was something that I wanted to do my family proud especially my mum um she always said for my education to come first um and I turned down a scholarship at Harvard, so it was kind of, I wanted to show her that, yeah, I can get a degree and play football here in England and 
I needed to do at a high level. Mm -hmm. A couple of things off the back of that. I suppose first and foremost, was it the football and wanting to pursue that that made you turn down the Harvard opportunity? I mean, yeah, Harvard. It's it a was, big name in itself. Yeah, I mean, it, unreal opportunity for me. Um, I couldn't quite get to grips with it when I was obviously, you know, speaking to them, sorting out my scholarship, sorting out where I'd live and being on campus over there in the States. Um, but it was it was during the time we were prepping for the under twenty World Cup. We were like two years two years into our program or something like that. Um and it's just that was a top priority for me. And my mum was kind of pushing towards the education, like you need both. It's not the same as the men's, we do need both. It's not quite sustainable just yet. Um but I knew I could study and play here, so I kind of pursued it here. Um, and it's also to show um, the other generation that you can stay because a lot of them are choosing to fly out because just because of the access that you get over there. So in terms of the facilities and the professional side of things is very much a higher standard than it is over here for, for those ages. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to show them that you can study and play here as well. Yeah, because that, that's often been mentioned as a big draw, the scholarship system. That yeah have over in the states what what was it in particular that or made you want to show people that you were perfectly capable of doing something similar here that you didn't have to go off to the states to do it i think just because a lot of them were flying out um i know it's kind of i think i would have 100 percent suited the lifestyle over there in america and would have loved it and i think a lot of people expected me to take the harvard scholarship and and to go um, but I knew I wanted to stay in England and kind of make my way here first because it was a league I want to play in. Well, one of the leagues I want to play in in the world. So, yeah. If sort of the WSL wasn't what it is now, I suppose yeah. you didn't have that draw for playing in the WSL. Yeah. Would you have potentially would that have pushed you more to go into the states? Yeah, I think 100% it would have. I think I, I would have jumped at the idea. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have, have thought of any reason to stay because I would have got the best of both worlds out there too. If anything, that kind of sums up the draw that the league has in itself because we, we speak so often about all the talent that's coming in through the transfer, mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, but if it's enough of a draw to keep players here yeah. in the education system, then that's, yeah. to me, that's a way we haven't really looked at it before in mm -hmm. terms of the draw of the actual league. Mm -hmm. What was it? Or has it, has law always been sort of the way you've pointed in terms of education? What, what about it? Yeah, um, I used to watch like Law and Order when I was really young, which is kind of weird. Yeah. But my yeah, my mum put it on and I loved it. And like CSI and all all the crime programs, I've always been drawn towards it. And I think my mum knew from a young age that that was the path that I'd probably take. Um, because, like, the likes of Law and Order, you wouldn't expect, like, a nine-year-old girl to happily watch. Cause it's quite intense. Um, so, yeah. yeah what is it about it? Is it just, do you, get, do you get caught up in, not so much the drama side of it, but just... Yeah. No, it's just the cases. I think with Law, it's fine in the loopholes and... Just you have to be clever, you have to really know the case, really understand the case and just stuff like that and how you analyse and how you evaluate things and yeah, it's just I just find it really interesting. And and like you say, doing a law degree is no easy feat either. Uh, yeah. I, I had to do media law obviously for my job and that's just a tiny, tiny fraction <laughs> of law. Yeah. That stressed me out enough. Yeah. So I mean, you talked about sort of juggling the, the three and a half hour drives with training and all that sort of stuff. Were, were there bits where you kind of felt like you were missing out on the football side of things and the catching up with the team versus chasing your education at the same time? Yeah, Pro it, probably, it probably did hinder my football at some points because there'll be days where I just couldn't train to the 100% because I was so tired or I'd be staying up the night before because I've got an exam in a week or two weeks. So I'd be staying up till 2am studying reading 
that that's just the student I am. I'm very much a night worker, I, th I, I think, and a crammer. So, yeah, of course, it, I found it hard. But, like, when I look back at it now, I wouldn't change anything because it just made it worth it. I was going to say, now that you can look back on those last three years, it must feel ultimately incredibly rewarding to have gone through all of that and then come out the other end with yeah. that degree. 100% and the thing is for me I'm not stopping so I want to get my masters and I want to do an LPC so I'm just having a breather at the minute and then I'll be back back to it. <laughs> I think a breather is somewhat warranted. Yeah all of that. I think so too. Did, I mean, did the coronavirus impact on the end of the course or the graduation or anything like that because I know yeah. people have their ceremonies cancelled and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, towards towards the end of my degree, um, we weren't allowed on campus. But luckily for me, our uni is quite organised, so we have every everything online anyway. Um, so some lectures were already pre-recorded. Like teachers were already quite active in terms of that, and they also put lectures that we were able to do online. So people from all around the world were able to. We were still able to study. So I feel like we were quite fortunate with the uni that I was at. Um, but yeah, it, they've, um, it's cancelled my graduation ceremony, which I'm really sad about because it, <laughs> like it, it just would have been a perfect end to three years. But hopefully soon we'll be able to do it properly and mm -hmm. I'll be able to wear the cap and gown and throw it in the air. That's part of the package, isn't it? <laughs> Whenever you go, yeah. you've got to have that day. Um, yeah, exactly. But it, it sounds nice that they haven't flat out cancelled it either. There's still an opportunity in June. Yeah. And then you kind of alluded to it there, going forwards and the master side of things. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of know where you want to go uni-wise or sort of how, uh, much time, how much of a break you want to give yourself before you dive back in? I'm not too sure, but I'm going to put it out there I'm kind of try and set my eyes on Cambridge see if see if they're open to having a professional athlete slash student if they're able to cater for for my needs in terms of doing a master's so like it, it would be very much a uni that I'd like to study at um but I haven't explored that option quite yet because I don't know when like the right time will be because of covid and stuff at the minute yeah, I think quite a few people are left in that almost limbo land at mm -hmm. the with what's going on. In terms of the uni experience then, and for a lot of people, me as well, it's, I suppose it's that time where you find out a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest thing you learned about yourself in that three years? Oh, <laughs> that's a hard question. I, I think it's quite quite different for me because I'd lived away from home since I was 16, 17. Um, so I was very much independent at the start of uni, whereas the girl that my like my mates who were coming in were coming from home, like never had a job and stuff like that. Whereas I was already past that level, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I would say I very much organized my life. There were days where I was just not on it and it just fell down so yeah I'd say I'd become more organized I suppose building that structure in some yeah. way you can because yeah. like I say it's like prof it's professional multitasking as far as I'm concerned I do love the uni life of putting pasta in the kettle and stuff like that <laughs> and turning the sideways to make a grilled cheese sandwich so yeah but those are the real life skills we all yeah. draw out <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it, looking sort of long term maybe not too far long term but is the law side of it is that the ultimate aim to essentially yeah. whether it gets into a law firm or whether it's criminal law or specific branch of law you're looking at no I think well I promised my mum I'd own a law firm one day so that's that's it's a big promise to make isn't it I'm not sure now now that I've made it but no yeah it's definitely on the cards for me and it's something that I've always dreamed of um and it'll take some time, I know it will, but hopefully I can get there. Like I say, big promise, but if you promised it, then you've got to stand mm -hmm. by now, don't you? Exactly. <laughs>
Make sure you follow Sportspiel on social media. Search for at Sportspiel Pod on Twitter, Facebook, and on Instagram. Moving kind of back to the football side of things, and you mentioned kind of building a structure for your life and learning that through uni. Has that helped in some way with the footballing side of things, whether it's, mm-hmm. I suppose, training, essentially keeping yourself motivated and in the best condition to perform at your best? Yeah, 100%. I think biggest thing for us is being disciplined and, like you said, being the best that we can seven days a week when we're training and when we're on match days so it's very much keeping up with the demands of being a professional at fleet but at the same time can we raise standards every day um that that's the biggest thing because it's easy to be complacent it's easy to just go through the motions every day and just kick a ball about and that that's it Mm -hmm. but yeah for me that's not good enough um so it's kind of how can we build on that does that is that something that's always come naturally to you that push and drive because I suppose it differs from person to person doesn't it some people learn it yeah. don't, aren't really bothered by it I think yeah I think it does come naturally um I think it helps the fact I'm in a team sport because you find it's similar morals similar values and especially here at West Ham it's very much the same and being on the same page with everyone and doing everything for the team and the team first so yeah Another big question to throw out. Looking at the player that started at Liverpool to the player mm. you are now at West Ham, what, mm. what's the biggest difference in that player? Um, I'd like to think I've become more like game intelligent. Like, I'm, not, I'm not quite there where I want to be, but in terms of reading the game and reading, reading the game quicker, I think that's something that I've always wanted to work on. So reading the past before it's even made and reading like triggers. That's definitely something I want to always want to grow and always want to, to learn. And obviously all the different movements and not just knowing different movements, but why like certain players make certain movements. So understanding it as well. Mm-hmm. And then I suppose this is something wider that's been talked about and I suppose footballing nerds, etc., can get very caught up in it. But like the role of a fullback has like changed so much and certain players have almost reinvented it in some mm-hmm. ways d- d- is there as a fullback do you kind of get that extra sense of responsibility considering what I suppose the modern day demands are of a fullback um I think every p- position's changed not just not just the fullback but obviously yeah it's become more attacking like I'll speak about Liverpool in terms of the men's. You've got Trent and Robbo, who are doing so well and getting assists pretty much every game. So they're very much raising the standards themselves, and and we do that in the women's game as well. Uh, if uh, if anyone can replicate those assist records that those two have got, then <laughs> you're on. You're well on your way to being a star fullback. Um, throughout your career as well, because I think we all agree that. Reading, Doncaster, there's probably a lot of learnings along the way. Yeah. What do you think have been the biggest takeaways that you got from those experiences? Um, considering you're playing with like very top, very good top class players at both those clubs at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, just making sure I stay coachable. So always wanting to learn, I think, is, is a big thing. And always going, always knowing my mistakes, recognising it and growing from it in the next game. Because it's easy to to just forget about them and easy to just blame it on someone else. And I think in football, you have to look at yourself first and look at, are you doing enough for the team? And are you actually playing your best before you go and point fingers at someone else? So I think think definitely for me, that's the biggest takeaway. Probably a big life lesson in there for a lot of people too. Yeah. Same time. 100%. Biggest highlight on a football pitch for you? Biggest highlight? I'd say, well, got a few. One of them is my first, obviously my first Super League goal. 
that was a big one. And it was against, someone asked me this question when I was at Reading, and it's against, um, it was against them, um, Lawsy, mm-hmm. when she played at um, Sunderland. And obviously we played together at Reading, so I always used to give us a stick about it. <laughs> um, but that's a good highlight. And then obviously, under 20 World Cup, getting bronze. Not quite gold, but it's a, it's a good baseline. But still, and it, and it shows, certainly to me anyway, even at youth level, how much the national team mm-hmm. has progressed in the last few years. Yeah. And particular experience as well, sort of knockout football, because mm. it teaches you, I imagine, all sorts of different things too. Is that something you, you can take into the domestic side of the club game as well, when you can look back on those experiences? Yeah, of course. It's, well, it's still, I think it's still high level to play at. You know, we're not quite playing against older players, but it's still still quite high standard and quite intense on camp. Um, so, yeah, we can take away things on a domestic level in terms of having to win games and having that pressure of we are going to get knocked out. We aren't going to play as many games if we're not still in this competition. So, yeah, it's definitely something I can take away. But for me, in terms of international level, it definitely pushes me on to want to be at the seniors. And... I suppose when you consider, you know, the manager that's coming in next year and the mm-hmm. way the team is going, that must just be such an incentive for players like yourself to really push on and get into that yeah. squad at the same time. Yeah, I think the Euros being pushed back is definitely a big push for me. It gives me time to to try and showcase myself and try and improve in them two years and hopefully do everything right to knock on the door to um yeah, to get myself there. Taking the highlight question and throwing it on its head. Mm. Biggest challenge in football? Biggest challenge or biggest heartbreak? We got knocked out by West Ham <laughs> when I was at Reading. I remember the... that thing. <laughs> Again, I watched that, that on penalty. Yeah, that was so hard. To do. Like, I, I think I didn't speak after that game for a couple of days. It was... It was for me to end on penalties is hard because um, you feel like you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. And the penalty shootout that happened was nowhere near a good standard or good enough, especially for the team that we were at at Reading and the players that took penalties. The expectation level was a lot higher than what was delivered. And I think that was the most disappointing thing about it. I suppose in, in terms of that Reading team. Yeah. Well, we've spoken to Remy Allen a couple of times mm-hmm. on the podcast and mm. like, the standards that team set itself was I think mm-hmm. something that not just us but quite a few people picked up on so mm-hmm. th- to hear you say that you didn't speak to speak for two days yeah. after that penalty shootout so it's kind of the perfect example of how seriously you took that competition mm. I think I th- yeah I think that that's just me on a personal level um I hate losing I hate conceding goals. It's it's like I do it every day. It's my job. So when things go wrong, I, I don't expect, accept it. And when it's not to a higher standard, it's, it's even harder to deal with. And I think the girls at the time knew it as well. So, yeah, it was it was tough to take. Do, does that, because I suppose all the conversations I've had, you can use that in two different ways, whether it's, something to look back on and learn from or has it essentially fueled that desire again to Mm. go on better if ever that opportunity arises again it's it's done both really of course you could i could always look back on the game and learn from it as much as i can and at the same time it's like I, i never want to feel like that again being so close to playing at wembley and obviously being being english like wembley's such a big big thing for us and to be to play at Wembley would mean so much so yeah it was it was really hard to miss out on mm-hmm. does I don't know this is something that's just popped into my head but does playing at Wembley is it almost more of a special thing in the women's game just because that opportunity doesn't sort of come along as often sort of thing if you yeah, can well, play the Premier League yeah I think, 100% I think so I think in terms of men obviously Tottenham used it as a home ground And I think it's kind of taken away that part of 
of the of the um special moments I'd say at Wembley um for the men but of course for the women having finals um makes it massive makes it a big difference for us and it keeps that keeps it as a special occasion mm-hmm. and I think it stay that way because I suppose I compare it to a lot of the big stadium showcases that there were last mm-hmm. season whether it was at Stamford Bridge the yeah. stadium at the Spurs stadium as well and it's just the, those opportunities to play at a massive stadium in front of a huge crowd mm-hmm. just don't come along as often we obviously like to see them come along more but it's almost like it's more unique if that makes sense to yeah. get the opportunity so that when you do mm-hmm. come so close and miss out it's, I think it's totally understandable that you'd feel that way 100% is that I suppose following on from that and the hating to lose if you were to use one sort of key characteristic that would de- define Matt Deco, the footballer, <laughs> what would that characteristic be? Um, I'd say probably motivated, if, that, if that's a characteristic, would oh, you say? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd say I'm very motivated as a person. As a person and a player, but as a person first. Because obviously we're people first. Um, but yeah, I think that would be me. In a nutshell, is it almost as important to you to be that motivated person first and foremost before you're that motivated player? They kind of go hand in hand, rather than focusing solely on the football and yeah. neglecting your personal family life. If that makes sense, I think it's a, a balance of both, really. Because if you've got to be both in both aspects of life, um, but it obviously helps if you are outside of football the same person well not the same person but the same drive and motivation and wanting to do well and wanting to succeed obviously it heightens when you're in football so it would obviously be a massive benefit if you are Mm -hmm, definitely moving on then to this is a question i've been asking quite a lot of our recent guests primarily primarily rather based on the bbc sport elite sportswomen survey that came out at the start of last month mm. and it's specifically the questions on body image that came out off the back mm-hmm. of that survey the key one being that 78 percent of the sportswomen who were surveyed said that they were subconscious about their body mm-hmm. their body image and it's something we asked helen ward uh diana cooper and ella massar about mm. broadly on what or if you'd seen people, whether it's in football or people mm. you know in society, struggling with that and whether the societal pressures there are on, I suppose, female athletes in general to look a certain way because you just don't get that type of scrutiny in the men's, in men's sport. Yeah. Has any kind of impact on you as players or you as people? Um, yeah, I think personally it hasn't impacted me. I think I'm quite... Like I, I'm quite confident in myself and not really bothered about all that stuff. But some players I've been around and top level players and senior players, which I've been quite surprised that have been very much reading the calories that they take, are careful about how much carbs they're eating and just things that I would never have opened my mind to until I was obviously playing with them and with them every single day. So I think there are, there are massive pressures there. Um, and I think it's how can we help them not to internalise them like, I, like I've said before um, very much keep them on an external factor and just try and get them happy in themselves first and foremost is, is the big, biggest thing I, I reckon mm-hmm. um, yeah there's definitely pressures there and I think female athletes are more vulnerable to it but it's it's a hard subject to speak about because it's something that they've that they're not confident with, and it's hard to change the mindset of someone, especially if they don't want to be helped. That that's where things can go quite difficult. Yeah, because it it like you say, it's a really it's a complex topic. It's there's no singularity to it because it can be a mental thing as much as yeah. anything else. Yeah, and it's very everyone's different so what might work for someone might not work for someone else and yeah it's, it's, it's a very complex topic like you said and it's hard and I think it'll be hard for people to speak about um but 
yeah they like they just need help I think in that sense and just support as from teammates I think we are we are very supportive of teammates being there for them and just trying to help them I think is the biggest and just making sure you're there for them how much of a role does um the social media side of things come into play because I suppose it's often argued sort of the the pressures that something like Instagram can give mm-hmm. on people when you're scrolling through pictures and you see you know whether it's airbrushed or not the perceived image of perfection yeah you know what I mean I think, yeah I think as long as the women's game grows the, obviously the more attention you'll get on social media um and with that comes both good and bad um and it's something that you have to take with it you can't take one or the other it, it just comes both naturally so I think for us as athletes you just have to ignore that side of things and try to not read it and get yourself caught up and if you do that's where things can start to change and can really affect someone Mm -hmm. how do you find social media is it something you like to sort of separate yourself from a little bit or does it does it kind of go both ways Uh, both both ways really I'm not that fussed about it I mean I, I I do do enjoy it. I like being connected to the fans, and obviously, it's good for family. Being connected to family is which I, I really like. Um, but I just try and use it for the positives. Um, you know, I like getting all the good luck messages and knowing what fans think in terms of the good side. Obviously, not the bad side of things. And um, it's just nice for them to have access and knowing that I, I can actually reply to them and appreciate them as they do for me too. Yeah, like you say, it's it's got both sides to it because I think one of the reasons so many people appreciate the women's game is that accessibility mm-hmm. and send a good luck message and get acknowledged for it in some way. Mm-hmm. And I suppose, it, it, again, it differs from person to person and athlete to athlete. So I know we've spoken to some athletes who like to switch off if they're in tournament mode, for example, completely. And then there's some who really like to be involved in it. When, yeah, when they're in a knockout tournament, whatever it might be, so yeah. it kind of goes best of both worlds, and you kind of don't want to let the bad eggs spoil it mm. as, yeah. much, as much as they try. And, and the number of different incidents we've found or seen over the last while that mm-hmm. show can have the negative side of it. In terms of kind of the power of social media as well, does I suppose in essence being a role model to people. Mm-hmm. Is that something that easily comes to you or does it still seem a little bit weird that you've almost got this responsibility attached to just being a footballer? I think it, it just comes with the game. It's something that you have to take with it. Um, you know, younger generations are, are going to be watching and how you present yourself and how you act and the way you behave and everything will be picked on. All the little things will be picked up and, I always think of it as if you had family around or the, your little cousins, your little sisters, how you'd want them to look up to someone is always in the back of my mind. Um, so that's how I'd always want to present myself and always wanting to be polite and responsible. Mm-hmm. A big like, thing. Yeah, definitely. And again, something that often gets mentioned um, about the positivity surrounding women's football. In terms of kind of women's football in general and the continued approach for people to keep pushing it because I think particularly at the start of the the lockdown there were so many calls and I suppose people speaking about about how worried they were that it might get left behind I suppose specifically from say a financial point of view when Mm -hmm. you saw a number of grassroots clubs or clubs lower down the leagues folding unfortunately how how important is it that we keep pushing the product, I suppose, whether it's stadium showcases or just shouting about how good it is whenever we get the opportunity? Mm-hmm. Well, it's massive. Um, obviously, the women's game's still growing, so any little thing will help. Um, and just having that exposure will, will do like big things for, for different clubs. And obviously, it's sad when grassroots clubs have to fold, but just shows how much more needs to be done. Mm-hmm. And how how can clubs connect to communities to try and help them out is a big thing. 
yeah and like i said so much potential there as well yeah. last couple of questions and that is essentially looking ahead and i suppose your own specific aims for this season what do you not so much for the club but in terms of yourself how would you like to see yourself grow over the next season just being a consistent player I think is a big thing for me I want to perform consistently on the pitch and like I said try and do things not perfect but make good decisions make the right decisions at the right times and just recognizing the game that I'm in mm -hmm. is definitely the aim for me and I think for me it just just take it game by game I don't want to think too far ahead of myself at the minute the team, what can, whenever fans are able to get back into the stadium in full, mm -hmm. what can we expect to see from you and the team as a collective unit over the next few months? Um, I think you'd see us fight for each other on the pitch, 100%. Um, we graft for each other. I think you'll see a lot of passion. Um, I'd like to think you'll see good combo play and a lot of goals being scored a lot of goals being celebrated so yeah it's just exciting fingers crossed as a West Ham fan yeah <laughs> yeah and like I say if the opening goal of the season is anything to go by then there's some good things coming so yeah. go, look, go look at that on YouTube if no one else has with that then um that brings an end to this particular episode so thank you so much Maz for coming on no problem and the chat and essentially sharing why you are the top multitasker right now <laughs> in all yeah. and I'm sure whether well not just at a football ground but I'm sure at a university somewhere we'll probably see you make an appearance at some point soon <laughs> yeah another law degree so uh, ultimately thanks again for coming on a lot of important messages there and we look forward to seeing the season pan out no problem thank you very much appreciate it The Women's Football Diary is brought to you by Sportspiel. You can join the conversation and spread the word using hashtag Women's Football Diary now on social media. You can follow Sportspiel on Twitter, Facebook and on Instagram using the handle Sportspiel Pod and visit our website which is sportspielonline.com. The Women's Football Diary will return next Friday with a brand new episode featuring England international and former Arsenal and Chelsea defender Anita Asante. Thank you.